it's always uh, great to have uh, Ian with us. Thank you so much for joining us and coming all the way from BK. And then we have uh, Gary Hunter from AT&T and Steve Yergo from T-Mobile, uh, both uh, longtime uh, attenders of this conference and, and supporters of this conference as well. So uh, welcome, all of you, and I will kick it over to uh, our moderator, Ian. Okay. When he says long time, he means you're old. <laughs> so is this on? Yes? Yes? Um, some, some older than others, by the way. Yeah, yeah, some older than others. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, do I have a clicker? Oh, there you go, there you're doing it, you're doing it, great. So, um, so what we did here, uh, we kind of uh, did kind of a little bit free form because uh, we actually, Gary and I decided that Yergo could actually stand up here for 45 minutes and talk to a three-legged stool all on his own and we wouldn't have a problem. But we decided to put some content into it. So he's not, he never, and I, by the way, I did tell him that the other day, and he didn't, uh, he didn't argue with me. So, um, so what we thought we'd do is we're going to kind of go through from the wireless operator perspective of where we are with the networks and the industry and some of the challenges. And there's, it, it's an interesting situation right now because there's a lot of things have changed over the last couple of years, obviously with COVID, but now we're entering this wonderful thing called inflation, interest rates going up. That is playing havoc with the cost to build networks, for example. At the same time, we're getting the efficiencies of 5G, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got competing forces here in terms of what's happening. What I would ask, I'm going to ask everybody this to start with, is who is spending more today with their cellular carrier than they were a year ago? One. Anybody else? Who's, oh, you were just putting your hand up to wave? Okay. Okay. Who's who's spending less today? One, two, yeah, yeah, um, th and that's pretty common. The the revenues in the industry are not increasing per line per user. Um, so it's uh, you know you've got different forces at play here, which we'll kind of get into. So first thing we're going to talk about, you know, goodbye five three G, hello five G, etc. Um, we'll talk about 5G, the benefits. Uh, we'll talk about Spectrum a little bit. We'll talk about challenges in 2023. We'll talk at the end about ORAN and the movement to open RAN. And then we'll, we'll leave time for Q&A. This panel does stand between us and lunch, okay? And I'm hungry. So I'll tell you, we're ending at 45 minutes. Um, so, Gary. Yeah, so 3G, um, we all shut it down during uh, 2022. Um, AT&T was back in February, um, and we've pulled, been pulling the spectrum off there. Um, both T-Mobile and Verizon have, have shut their networks down over the year. Um, certainly from evaluation implications, um, that equipment is either being pulled out or it's being abandoned in place. Um, you're having to cut the cables. Um, um, and the power to those and shut it down. In a lot of cases, it's not cost effective to remove it. So it's just, it's just abandoned there in the shelters. Um, the other aspect of it is, 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 is all this equipment, or a lot of this equipment is sitting in shelters. And for people who have been around for a while, if you remember the old GSM cabinets, the 3G shelters, those things are big. Um, they're, they're the size of refrigerators. The equipment today is as big as, um, this computer on the front, yet we still have all that equipment sitting in the shelters, a lot of super adequacy there, and a lot of um, 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 opportunities to look at that from a valuation perspective. Is there super adequacy or excess capital costs within, within your network? Yeah, and we're doing the same thing, right? And I think we just go to the 3D, we shut it down, it's happened, um, and we're also already moving to the obsolescence of the 4G network because we're quickly going into 5G and LTE. So you're already talking about obsolescence for LTE? Absolutely. Wow. Long-term employment, you know. That's what it stands for. <laughs> Until Lo there's uh, long. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I think mean, we'll get there that fast. Um, so, uh, um, so you had the Sprint Network as well, right? Correct. And it, was a, it was a very busy year for us on, on the Sprint Network and the 3G. So we shut down the Sprint 4G network also, right? So okay. that took place in the middle of the last year. Um, it was really intensive for us. Uh, so everyone understands we had a three and a half year plan when we merged these two companies together 
and we did it in, I'm looking to John back there, in less than two and a half, right? We did it a year early, right? So John is in the room here from the classic sprint side and OP. Thanks for being here, John. But uh, we shut it down really quick. We used the same formula we did when we merged in with Metro in 2013. We had competing networks. We figured out how to shut it down quickly. We did the same thing with uh, the T-Mobile 4G network, um, or excuse me, the, the Sprint 4G network. Uh, we shut the network down. We still have some billing systems on the back end, but uh, we were able to at least transfer all the customers. They're roaming on the, the Anchor T-Mobile network is what it's one network now. So you're still sending out bills, but there's no network? No network, correct. Okay. okay. <laughs> For the Sprint folks, right? They're on the T-Mobile. I want you to know the fastest and most reliable 5G network in the country. And the PR requirements now checked for you go. Um, <laughs> so uh, there were, I mean, don't underestimate how much work this was because not only was the network side, but there were all those devices. Anybody bought a car back in 05 to 10 with a modem in it, that was a 3G modem, right? They all had to be changed out or decommissioned or whatever. So yeah, and in fact, um, there was a lot of, um, uh, between the, the um, security companies and so forth, if you remember back yeah, a year ago, systems, yeah. Yeah, they, you know, they wanted to push the, um, the delay of shutting down 3G out another year or so. Right. Um, right. Um, so all you've both got then is LTE and 5G? Yes? Correct. All right. Okay. That's, that's good. Um, Verizon shut those down at the end of the year. Um, they announced it. I think they were... Uh, I can't remember when they were originally planning to, but it was actually all done by the end of 22. So there is the 3G that's left is with smaller operators. Some of them do have, um, you know, some of these small guys up in the Dakotas and things like this. But um, you won't be roaming onto them because you don't have any devices left. <laughs> so, and they're not roaming onto you because you have no network. So, um, so it's gone pretty quickly. Um, bandwidth, uh, Steve, I think you had or well, somebody had some stats. Uh, we went through a few versions of this, by the way. Usage in national football games? Yeah, so, yeah, so, um, and um, Jeff talked before about millimeter wave and, and the uses for it. And, and for us, it's usually in, in like in stadiums and, and in certain areas where there's a lot of density. It's real expensive to deploy, particularly the equipment. Um, for the national football championship game between UGA and um, um, TCU, the usage during that game was 10.7 terabytes of traffic. So um, we certainly have come a long ways. Was most of that the TCU fans trying to find out where their car was and <laughs> you know, ordering takeout on the way home in the third quarter? Oh, sorry. 49ers. 49ers. Yeah. Um, so uh, data increases about 35% a year. The usage uh, actually, it's, we, we actually ran it historically back to 10. I think we did a chart, and it goes up and up and up. It's pretty consistent, 35, 40 percent a year, except for 2020. It goes up 19 and goes flat, and then goes up again because everybody ran home in the in the pandemic. They weren't coming downtown Austin, walking around at lunchtime. They're all sitting at home on Wi-Fi, fighting with their kids for the bandwidth arguing over who was going to use 5G, et cetera, et cetera. And so the network pattern changed quite a bit then, but then when everybody started resuming going back to the office, it went up again. But the other thing is that uh, there's more video, more media, more apps. The video is the one that uses the bandwidth. And I would challenge, I've, I've made this challenge to people, go look at a website like for the New York Times or Google News or Washington Post and find an article that does not have embedded video in it. See how long it takes you to find it, and it's a long time. So it's not just FaceTime, WhatsApp, chit chat, you know, TikTok. You do TikTok? No. No. <laughs> Steve does. Um, <laughs> um, so it's, it, and that's not stopping. It's not like we're suddenly going to get to the point where there's no more things to add. A really good example is Netflix. Netflix a few years ago, if you went to Netflix on a, sta on a mobile device, it used standard definition. They flipped a couple of years ago to high def. So everything they send out is high def. And one day they're going to go to 4K and then 8K. 
And you think, why do I need 4K on my mobile device? Because the screen's going to be able to take it, and it's going to be on a tablet, and it's going to look great. And the network's going to have to carry the traffic. So, so um, going up there, it's, uh, it, the bandwidth is increasing, which means we're going to have to have these things. So what does 5G give us? If you guys want to talk about from your perspective, what do you see, network perspective, what benefits do you get? Sure, I'll, ju I'll jump right in on the 5G front. And when we talk about that spectral efficiency, we talk about the timing of the rollout. And I want to give one quick plug on the timing of the rollout, that when Sprint and T-Mobile came together, we had a whole bunch of 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, 130. I think that was cut out of this. Uh, but uh, effectively, we're a year and a half ahead of my friends here at AT&T and Verizon on, on trying to build out a nationwide what we consider a 5G footprint uh, using either two and a half gig or three and a half gig spectrum. Um, we're looking at having 300 megs by the end of this year. I don't know the exact number right now, but it's roughly 220 right now. Um, and the reason I bring that build out up is because of uh, the amount of capacity that has been released with 5G. And one of those cases around that is our fixed wireless, right, our high speed internet. Um, we're in the internet business now, right? We provide internet connections to the home, and I want to just talk about that for a quick moment, just to get hammer home the competitive front. Uh, Verizon released, AT&T released yesterday, Comcast released this morning, I'm looking across the charter, they're releasing tomorrow, we'll, we'll release next week, so it's the shit show for the earnings season right now, um, and the games that are out there. You wanted to so I was just going to add, so yeah, so yesterday we announced that for, for um, 5G in the mid-band spectrum, we're at 150 million um, subscribers or um, coverage. Uh, so we expect by the end of this year we'll be close to, to covering 300 million would be my expectations or somewhere in that range. Um, you know, the other thing I want to touch upon this, and, and Jeff talked about it, you know, certainly the spectral efficiency, I mean, as more and more data comes on our networks, we've, like, we've got to become more efficient. It's critical, um, both in terms of, of the efficiency as well as the cost. I went back and looked at what the ARPUs were in, at the end of 2018 for voice um, um, ARPUs, and it was $55 in something. As of yesterday, for end of, eight, of 22, it was $55 in something. Revenues aren't increasing. I think that was reflective of, of here. So we're getting more and more traffic on our networks. Revenues ne don't necessarily increase. So our cost structure in order to handle the capacity has to change in order for, for the, us and as well as our um, 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 competitors in the business. Otherwise, it's, it's going to become a point where you, just, you can't make money at it. And so that's really what drives these evolutions to the next generation. Yeah, let me just jump in on that on the competitive front, uh, talking about you know, we talk about 5G and fixed wireless, and I'm just gonna run a couple stats for you guys real quick. Uh, Comcast released 365,000 wireless ads in the fourth quarter, right? 5.3 million to date, right? So Comcast has 500 million wireless subs, right, on their network. Verizon released 217 phone ads, right? T, yesterday, you had 656, I believe. You mean thousands? Thousands, thousands. sorry, thousands, not, not yes. Not 200 Not 200. Okay. 1,000, 656,000. T-Mobile pre-released the numbers early in January. We had 927,000 phone net ads in Q4. Okay, so it's a big quarter for everyone. We'll hear from Charter tomorrow when they release what their uh, nets for the quarter were. But the point that I wanted to make on this is that Comcast has 5.3 million total, total wireless subs right now, phones, right? And Charter had 4.7 as of Q3. So they'll release, they'll probably be over 500, 5 million. They're in the wireless business, right? We're in the landline business or the, or the broadband connection, the home internet. Our fourth quarter, we, re, we added 524,000 internet connections, right, in Q4 this year. We just started last year, and this was all about 5G and building out that spectrum as fast as we could. It's an excess capacity model, meaning you have a ray that's sitting out there, and that ray on a tower is shooting. One, you have three different triangles on your tower, and we're shooting a whole bunch of capacity in a certain direction. And we've looked at all the customer needs in that area, and we're saying, we don't have as many wireless customers in this particular ray 
right, to, to flood our network so we can offer a fixed wireless solution, right, for folks. And as of uh, the end of the year here, that was 524,000, right? We're at uh, 2 million net ads for 2022 and 2.6 million already. So we've only been at it five quarters. And we're going gangbusters on that. And I just want to illustrate the competitiveness of the industry on how we're getting into the broadband connections. We're putting pressure on the Comcast, the ATTs of the world, the Verizons. I believe Verizon is in a similar situation. They're adopting fixed wireless access, right? AT&T has uh, said, we don't think that's the best long-term solution. Uh, so we have differences in the industry, but uh, we're out there comp competing aggressively. Did you change departments that I didn't know, like you're Mr. Investor Relations now or something? Like, you're like a walking statistician book. Uh, well, I'll just say that, uh, you know, right now T-Mobile is winning, just for the record. Oh, oh. <laughs> we, we didn't get that. <laughs> um, so, I, so bandwidth's going up 35, 40% a year, right? There's more spectral efficiency with 5G. Are your network budgets going up? 35, 40% a year? No. Are they going up? No. No. <laughs> Steve? No, they're not. We're, our, our spend is going down in 2023 from, from the 2022 levels. OK, so the reason I bring this up is when you look at the metrics of what it takes to build network, run network, traditionally we had very well-defined uh, you know, buckets. Those buckets are changing in terms of how much is going into them, but the net overall is the budget is not going up, right? Because you can look at this and go, oh, well, look at all that data that's going up there and all these net ads and things. Oh, they must have, they must be throwing tons of money into the network that they're different, but that's not the case. Because well, I, the I, I, what happens is you have to make choices and it's the balancing act. So if, if your costs go up, you may not be able to put, um, you know, deploy fiber by as many homes that year, or you may have to scale back on how many um, um, towers um, uh, you convert. Um, it, but it is a balancing act because you don't want to lose, um, you know, you, you still have a plan to deploy it. You still have a plan to um, pass so many homes. And so, so, but it does create challenges. Right. See, that was really subtle because you just dropped in fiber like that. Steve can't have that discussion, as you know. That's why you dropped it in. <laughs> oh, it's well, I can't have that discussion because we just got rid of a, a long distance unit and not all fiber is created equal, right. just for the record. We sold the old Sprint long distance uh, unit that. for $1. $1. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Spectrum. Um, low band, mid band, high band. Um, let's talk specifically about C band because both of you spent quite a bit of money uh, buying that spe C-band spectrum. So where is it in terms of the deployment with that in that mid-band for 5G? Yeah, so for AT&T, we bought, um, it's about 24, a little over 24 billion back in 21 on the um, C-band. Uh, as of um, the end of this year, um, we've got coverage on about 150 million um, homes throughout the U.S. And we participated, not as big as our competitor Verizon, but we're all out there they're competing. Um, I think one of the issues with CPAN, and Gary, maybe you're more alluded to talk to it, is uh, you know, FAA interference or lack thereof. And where is that at now? Yeah, so there was quite a bit of issues uh, related to um, um, potential interference with certain planes. Um, and so Verizon and us, um, we ended up you know, working with um, the FAA and, and, and came out with a solution. Um, there was an article here announced by the um, FAA just about two weeks ago that roughly 180 out of 8,000 planes were potentially impacted on altimeters, and the fix was around $26 million. So it was a, there was a lot of noise. I'm not sure, given where it ended up, that it was worth that noise, but um, it appears to be um, it, And maybe we can just step back for the basics. When we talk about C-band, we're talking about 3.5 gigahertz versus 2.5 gigahertz, where most of T-Mobile spectrum is at. So the, the dirty little secret on the F FAA thing is they knew about this all the way along. They knew they had a problem, but nobody wanted to cough up and buy new altimeters. So they just waited and waited and waited. Like, oh, you're launching service? We'll let those big carriers pay for it. It was just a game of chicken. And um, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. But um, So um, new spectrum coming? Any, 
I mean, I, the, the thing with Spectrum is everybody thinks you, you have the auctions in, what, 2021 for C-band. You get the Spectrum immediately. No, it takes a while. It takes physical time to visit cell sites. It takes time to get the equipment in the first place. But what do you see? Do you see this progress? We can have more? What, what, what do you think? I mean, I would think in general. I mean, Spectrum, I mean, that's the... It, it, it's a scarce resource, and that's what we need to um, continue to build out. So I would think that as time, and as kind of Jeff pointed out, more will become available, and certainly I'm sure all the um, companies will look at that. Yeah. We're always chomping for more, right? And that's the trade-off. You either need more spectrum or you need more capital investment. You've got to split the cell sites in order to make sure that you're dealing with the coverage. Yeah. And if you're splitting cell sites or adding new cell sites, you always run into the NIMBY effect because there are certain folks that don't want to see a cell site in their neighborhood, but they want 110% coverage. And, and I just wanted to add, you know, and, and if you look at it here, you know, got the mid-band, that's really where most of us are, are pushing out 5G. Um, there was early on some discussions, particularly with AT&T, around the, mid, or the uh, millimeter wave. Um, the propagation features for millimeter wave are not good, and it takes a, it's a real expensive, um, um, t real expensive to deploy enough equipment in an area to, to make it viable. And, and so, it's so, as I pointed out earlier, it's really more for us right now putting it in stadiums or putting it into through condensed areas in, in, in urban areas to where um, it makes sense, but it's, it's not a, right now a, something we would want to deploy on a broadband basis just because it's, it's real expensive to, from an equipment perspective. Yeah. So I, I don't know if Jeff mentioned, did he talk about which bands they're looking at next in detail? No? Um, Do you talk about the three gig band and the 13? No? He had, he had, a, he had his yeah. cake there, yeah. Yeah, so there's a, the next band they're looking at is three gigahertz, um, and it's, de it's Department of Defense, big surprise. The, the reason it's, uh, it's interesting is because the equipment for C band and CBRS and two and a half gig is really close to three, and you can use some of the same antennas and upbanded and you get some efficiency. Yeah, and at and bought 40 um, yeah. uh, megahertz were in, uh, in this year, or last year. Last so. year, right. So there's um, the, uh, and then the other band is the 13 gig one, which is used by a lot of satellite stuff, and that's when you get arguments coming from uh, Starlink, because uh, they're like, no, we're using that one, et cetera, et cetera. So, but there's nothing on the cards right now, which means there's nothing, nothing will happen in probably 2023. If they announce something, it'll be for an auction in 24 if they decide to go the auction route, which means you won't get it implemented until at least 2025, late 25 or 26. So the spectrum you have now outside of um, acquisitions of other sources is what you get. There's, there's very little coming. Um, but you know, you've got plenty to keep saying. So. Uh, right. Um, all right, so let's talk about economics, costs. Um, so let's start, actually, let's talk about inflation. Let's start with the fourth one. So what has inflation done in your world? So certainly what inflation said for us, it's, it's made it a lot more expensive on our capital budgets as well as the operating costs, but certainly on the capital budgets to, to build out the networks. Um, if you think about it from a valuation perspective, you know, if, if if your revenue is $100 and it takes you $20 to push that equipment out there um, to get a return on that investment, um, the next year you come around and it's going to cost you, for that same $100 in revenue, now it's going to cost you $25. Have you gained any value? I would argue no. I mean, the, the inflation on that equipment, I mean, you're still earning the same revenue, therefore um, it's just cost you more to put that equipment out there. So. From that aspect of it, it, it is more expensive. Um, it's, it's required us to, as I said, um, do a balancing act in terms of how much we can deploy and what capital, and do we have to um, potentially, instead of pushing capital out this year, maybe push it out into the following year and so forth. Right. Steve? Yeah, and we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing in, increased pressures internally, right, uh, on, our, on our OPEX, what, what that looks like and how we drive down uh, costs throughout the business. I will tell you that, um, the pressures will continue to mount with this hyper-competitive industry that, uh, you know, we've done some things to offset some inflation, right? So to be fair to the subject, I mean, we may have pushed on our, our, our crown castles and our big partners where we've locked in some stuff that, that help offset temporary short-term inflation, 
but uh, all the additional OPEX, and I think we were chatting earlier, mm -hmm. gas prices, right, all of the other things that are running through to our bottom line um, are increasing our expenses, um, and that's definitely a, a challenge for us to live within that, those budgetary envelopes. And I would expect, you know, there, down the road, I think Jim's going to talk about broadband, but some of the government funding and what that's going to do in terms of, of, of the supply, labor supply, or our, our equipment supply in the market. Right. So there's an interesting thing about that because there's what 42 billion or so in bead and all that, all the funds, but when they allocated them, that was a year, 15 months ago. Nobody got the money yet. So every year that goes down by seven, eight percent. So by the time you actually get the money, it's worth 15, 20 percent less than when you actually said, "Oh, you're getting money," which is uh, it's a good one. So the, the I, I did pull some numbers. I we did some research on this last year. So steel, concrete, gas, and labor are the big things that go into building the physical network, aside from the equipment. Now, in some cases, you. The carriers won't see the cost of steel, for example, it'll be in the tower company, right? So if they're putting up a new macro tower, they're going to buy the, ta the physical tower itself. How the carrier, how the tower company passes that on to the carrier, that you know, depends on the contract and things like this. But it all, from our perspective, it all goes into cost of building network. So the steel, infra steel went up 80% between 2021 and 2022. Uh, it went up 350 percent, 300, 350 percent, depending on the type of steel, from 13 to 22. So, <laughs> um, over five years, it's a billion dollars extra just of the towers that it, new towers are getting built or replaced. Upgrades um, are included. What time period was that? That's over five years, five. so from 22 to 27. Concrete is an extra uh, 22 million in just in 2022 on macro towers alone. Um, and gas, <laughs> gas has always been about 4% of the cost of building a network or operating a network. There's a lot of driving, right? A lot of trucks. Um, from 2022, in the middle of the year, the 4% went up to 9% of the bill, right? That's how much share it was taking just from the increase in gas. A diesel and depends on again, but it's on the truck. Um, so in 2022, just the increase in the price of gas and added a billion dollars to the cost of building networks. Um, that was nobody got any benefit from that apart from the oil companies. Um, and then labor, um, the labor five year increase is about 375 million in labor costs, and that was at about four or five percent increase. Depends on the job function. There's a lot of job functions like climbing towers. They've gone up more than that. Other jobs, um, less so. But so there's a, a big m increase in a lot of different non-beneficial costs. This is not a radio, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, this is just the basics of uh, building a physical network. So supply chain, Have you, what do you see? Everybody talks about supply chain, everybody talks about issues. And I hear from Ericsson, Nokia, everybody about how hard it is to get chips. And do you, what do you see on your ends from the supply chain for radios, network equipment, et cetera? Um, I think there's some challenges there. We've been able to manage it so far, um, um, particularly uh, if you started early on in getting those contracts in place. I think that helped. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a good thing that we were 12 to 18 months ahead of these guys in building out our <laughs> network, so we were ahead of the supply chain curve. But with, there are some pressures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm sure you've heard somebody said, hey, sorry, you're not going to get that radio thing next week, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we talked radios. Yeah, just real quickly on that. Yeah. I mean, we touched on, on most of this. Um, we're putting 5G out there, so we're having the deploy new equipment up there, so we're climbing towers, we're, we're pulling all the older stuff off, putting new equipment up there. Um, I think everyone's familiar with some of the um, challenges on, on getting new sites approved, and, so, yeah. and that delays things. Um, so um, um, nothing really new there, it'll, it'll continue. And then um, for us, like on the transport up there, um, Consolidating baseband units into more centralized locations, um, utilizing fiber and so forth to make that process more efficient. That's some things that um, I think the industry and, and, and as well as us are looking at. Right. 
So you went through the rationalization of Sprint and T-Mobile networks and decommissioned some Sprint sites, depending on location. A lot of Sprint sites. A lot of Sprint yeah. sites. So is that done? That 3G decommissioning you talked about, is that rationalization done? That rationalization is done, and the 4G network on Sprint. So we shut down the 4G network, too. So okay. it is done. We announced that in the uh, middle of this year. Don't quote me, July, June, July, August, somewhere around there. We shut down the Sprint network. So there's some minor little trailing things, but 98% uh, yeah. but of the network is, is shut down. There's just some little technical stuff that we right. have to deal so with. So the reason I ask is because there was that rationalization. If you had two sites close to each other, you move one off the other. But that was part of that shutdown. Is That's what exactly what it Got was. It. Okay. And we maximized it. So we did shut down some T-Mobile sites in the process, yeah. right? Yeah. If there was a better footprint or RF yeah. penetration on, on the Sprint side. So we did keep some of those. But uh, we wanted to make sure we had a maximum RF footprint. Right. So going forward now, you're applying for permits and build out and all that, as out, just like everybody else, right? Uh, just like everybody else. It'll yep. be small build outs year yep. over year. Yep. Okay. All right. Anything else on that one? We talked about FCC, FAA. Uh, I think we covered I think it. We did. All right. Oh, you got the button. Oh. All right. ORAN. Who wants to start on ORAN? I can kick it off. So um, I saw this article here um, um, just here just a couple of weeks ago from the NTIA talking about ORAN. And for those who, it's open RAN. Um, so as you see a picture here of a, of, of a traditional RAN, which is what most of um, our network's comprised of, you know, the, the network's sort of a closed system. You have the radios, you have the antennas, you have the baseband units. It's either a Nokia site, it's an Ericsson site. And, and that's pretty much who, you know, who controls it and how we operate it. Um, there's some opportunities that, you know, we've been at at and and I think the industry as a whole has been looking at, at going towards to a more of an open RAN type system. And that's where um, you have multiple vendors. The systems aren't closed. Um, so you can have a radio that's made by Nokia and you can have an antenna or a baseband unit made by, let's say, Microsoft, if you will. Um, and that introduces competition. It also simplifies the architecture within the network potentially. Yeah, so I, I'll layer on on the open RAN side of things. And there's two different things that are going on right now. T-Mobile is building its network, its 5G, its new radio, its standalone. So we have a standalone RAN and a core behind it, mm -hmm. right? So we're trying to advance it as fast as we can. I guess the one thing for ORAN is that when we look at the competitive landscape, I, I would be remiss if I didn't call out uh, a new competitor in the industry, and that is DISH, right? Mm -hmm. And DISH is out there building out an ORAN network. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at their charts and what they're doing, and they have uh, 30, 40 different vendors, um, and I'm not sure how that's all gonna work out, but maybe, Ian, you're closer <laughs> to that than I am. Um, but they had, they had deadlines that they were trying to build out their network. I think February last year, they had to have so many sites up and running in markets to maintain their licenses, and now they're pushing forward on that. But they are going down the ORAN right, path, and they're going back to an open you know, mm -hmm. core also, right, relying on vendors. Um, so stay tuned. Yep. Anybody from DISH here? <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's an interesting, they, their radios are from Fujitsu, who's actually a big Japanese vendor, doesn't have a lot of market share in the US uh, compared to Nokia, Ericsson, et cetera. Uh, the core at DISH is on Amazon Web Services, sits up in the cloud, and then they've got software for the, radio, uh, for the baseband and stuff from Mavenir. The new stuff they're starting to put out now, Samsung is in their lab, okay? which is very interesting because you've got a big traditional vendor, Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, uh, you know, they've got the majority of the, of the world. And Samsung's always been, no, not going to do open RAN, no, 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 now, yeah. <laughs> um, so open RAN is basically just having those different vendors, mixing and matching. You can go to cloud RAN, put your core up in the cloud, split out the baseband and all those things without having open RAN. You can do it with Ericsson and Nokia. And at and already done that. And you've done that, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Uh, all the carriers have started to do that. So cloud RAN does not equal open RAN, 
right? That's the first thing. But the two are actually happening simultaneously. So as the p carriers are moving to cloud, the open RAN came up. The problem with open RAN is the vendors are all small. Mavenir, Airspan. So big carriers go to small company and say, this looks great, vendor financing. You know, I'm like, whoa, what are you talking about? <laughs> or, yeah, uh, I need $2 billion worth of equipment. Whoa, 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 we, we can't, we're not that big, we can't do that. So that's where it's, it's, they're having problems. The, when I talk to the open RAN vendors, that's their challenge. Nothing to do with the technology, it's the scale of the deployments and what they're talking about. We were, I, my view is we get to the point, uh, I know enough folks at Nokia, Ericsson, et cetera, they'll do open RAN. And you announced last week, I think, at and announced last week, deploy tests with open RAN, with Fujitsu, and Northup Grumman, who makes the F-35, which I thought was a very interesting, but I don't know what they're doing, so, yeah. yeah. Well, and why it matters, I mean, Steve mentioned DISH, and I think, you know, in terms of how much um, they've announced, how much it would cost them to build a, a nationwide network, significantly yeah. a lot cheaper. Yeah. We talk about the CapEx here, and it's, you know, certainly a lot cheaper with an open RAN network of, you know, 35, 40% cheaper from a capital perspective. That should then evolve into a valuation um, aspect from a replacement cost. Yeah, so it's you're, much cheaper to deploy an open RAN network. If you're building a network today, <laughs> You don't put in, well, legacy 4G for a start. That's legacy. That does not go in. DISH does not do any of that. They start to from scratch. And it's a very different cost model. So, all right. We've got about eight minutes. Questions? Steve said he'll give anybody a free month of T-Mobile service if they ask a question. I actually have a gift for the two of you and Larry. I forgot to bring it. I was so damn tired. Yeah. I left it in the room. So uh, I don't wear ties you'll anymore. Get, uh, yeah. <laughs> We're not doing TikTok you'll, you'll appreciate this gift. So oh, stay shit. tuned. You'll see it after the break. I'll bring it down, and <laughs> we'll give it to you afterwards. So, any questions? Yeah. Steve, you ran through uh, Kind of a, a lot of the providers and how many subs they've they've added in the fourth quarter and or in 2022. Do you have a good feeling of where all those subs are coming from? If everyone's net positive, because I thought we were at, you know, pretty much full penetration on on mobile. It's not subs. It's connections. It's lines. So it's me having four members in our family. We've all got phones, right? Is somebody adding the Apple Watch, the iPad, the car, you go buy a new car, you get a connection. So the, nu the number of, let me get this right, there's 350 million people in the US. We exceeded one line per person back in 2015 or so, 14. Now we're at over, t what are we at? Like, I can't remember the number, 600 million connections, 500 million. That's where they're coming from, yeah. So, yeah, that's why when you look at the ad, you watch a football game, the first ad is Verizon, the second ad is AT&T, and the third ad is T-Mobile. And after the halftime break, they reverse them. You forgot Burger King. And what? <laughs> Burger King, yeah, okay. yeah. But if you look at those ads, they're all about more, like, you know, come to us and get a free phone and team, uh, this and this and this and this and this. It's those connections. Um, that's what it is. It's, so it's not people, it's things for people. And, and I think to the, to the point, on the people side though, a big chunk of it is the people, right? And I think there was an uptick in some of the phone connections last year and yeah. maybe 2021. And that's what the street is asking a lot of uh, in the analyst days, yeah. right? They're going, what's the normal, what's the expectation for, you know, 2023, you know, ads for the industry? What is that going to look it's, like? Believe it or not, not everybody has a phone. There's like a five, six percent don't have a mobile phone. They could be older. They're definitely younger. Um, the age at which kids get phones has come down and down and down. And uh, that's a big, uh, you know, yeah, you can say, no, I'm not going to do that. Or until your kid goes, no, I need a phone. <laughs> um, my daughter is Lauren Gillett. So she always loved LG phones because she thought they were named for her when she was a kid. <laughs> but I still remember when the first kid, she was in like 
she was like seven or eight when the first kids were getting phones in the class, and yeah. You know, so she wasn't the first; she's probably the second. But it's so there is that. Could will newborns get phones? Yeah, probably at some point there'll be a, a monitor you put on the baby, shows vitals, right? Oh, that, that already exists. Yeah. Apple birth or something it'll be called or something or I don't know. Yeah. And, and just for our perspective, I don't know our total net ads. I think it was 1.75 on the quarter, mm -hmm. right? But 900 and something were, uh, you know, phones. And then there were 500,000 uh, internet subscribers. Right? And, and then the rest of those are all right. the others. Now, he quoted as well the big carriers. Don't forget, about 10 percent of the market are the small guys. U.S. Cellular, etc. There's a lot of small operators out in rural America, and they are struggling very, very hard. They've got problems with the big guys taking their subscribers. They are in decline, and they were using Huawei equipment, which has to be put, ripped and replaced, and the government said they pay for it, but there's a shortfall of about $3 billion for that money. And there's inflation, and they can't get the financing to actually do it before the government pays them. So there's actually quite a few small operators that are just saying, done, selling my spectrum, selling my operations. But one I know sold to ATT and Verizon. They split the base and sold off because it was more cheaper to do that than build a 5G network and try and compete. So it's the, the entire universe is not sitting here. If you know, Verizon and Dish were sitting on the end, there are more than that. So there is play at that. So anybody else? Good question. Ruben, no questions? Well, oh, I was going to say. Yeah. Hey, Steve. I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, getting rid of that network on the Sprint side, I'm assuming, was not valuable to T-Mobile as a yeah. backhaul at all? The, the long-distance network? Right. Uh, no, it was a dog. Uh, mm -hmm. It was worthless. Um, I will give you the, this, some of the specs. John, help me out. Uh, we, uh, in, let me give you the background. So mm -hmm. Sprint had a network connected a wireless network and their long distance network and they were they were connected and we were using the sprint long distance in order to do some of that backhaul in q2 of 2022 right we disconnected that right so we transitioned everything off of that network and went to other vendors or other uh, other fiber providers okay right and when we did that in q2 we took a, a big impairment so the network wasn't worth much to begin with the numbers were about a billion dollars in net PP&E, and we took about a half billion dollar haircut on it in Q2. And then in Q3, we announced uh, the sale uh, to a small player. John, who's the uh, Cogent. vendor? Cogent. 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 Yeah. So now you've got, a, you've got a contract with them, though, for five years for IP services. Yeah. What's, Correct. What's the plan for after five years? So we have a, a contract with them because effectively the thing was worthless. Okay. Right, they're paying us a buck, and uh, then we're paying them for five years in order to help take it off of our hands. Right, gotcha. so the number out there was about don't quote me, go look at the press release about 300 million a year. Mm -hmm. Right, 200 300 million a year, we're paying them in order to say you figure out what you want to do with it because we can't make it work and we want to stick to our coordinating, which is a wireless network. So, you're not using the network at all for backhaul or anything? Uh, no. So the, the history on that is pre-merger, Sprint, you know, Sprint went through some rough years mm -hmm. and did not invest in that, that backhaul, right? right? It, was, it was not a modern network with the capabilities you need to support, even LTE and 5G. That's, right. It wouldn't work no. today. Exactly, and it's in the wrong location, right? So others have pointed out it depends on where the location of the fiber is, right, to make it valuable or not. Yeah. Um, and we're looking at that from a T-Mobile perspective. Right. We came out in its cities conference. Our CFO basically said, hey, uh, he was asked, are you guys looking at uh, any and all options around fiber? And we are kicking the tires in the early stages. Right. And just like our competitor here just announced, I mean, you guys have a, a JV, right, looking at further expanding. Yeah, and I'll touch upon that later. So. Ribbon? Yeah, the well, co a comment, and then I guess we're breaking for lunch. The uh, the idea of Dish Wireless coming in as a fourth player, I think everybody had 
a good sense that that, that was going to be the right approach. They were building That's a up six, the right. a six player, by the way. Four, five. Sure, sure. Let's count them. May as well. Then, then you have a situation where a, a carrier is coming in, building everything greenfield, doing it for far cheaper, using white boxes in a, in a, in a mechanism they, they thought would save them billions of dollars. So really, like the model citizen for what a greenfield would look like relative to what you guys are doing. And you think about just how mobile is not for the faint of heart, because back in November, they almost filed for bankruptcy. You know, they're now in a situation where they're, they're, they're seriously in, in debt, need, right? They, they are in serious need of funding. Mm -hmm. Even though you were able to get it done so much cheaper, you still have, you know, an incredible barrier to overcome. Right. So that's a really interesting point that DISH is two and a half. They just done another 500 billion, 500 million they need. So it's two and a half billion. You look at those, carry, those vendors I mentioned doing Open RAN, there is no way they're going to come up with two billion to fund Dish to buy their network, right? Vendor financing. Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung can do that in a heartbeat, and there's banks that'll help them do it. So the idea that Dish would end up buying from Nokia, Ericsson, and Samsung is not crazy at all. Um, the other thing with Dish I'd point to is Stephen Bai, who's the commercial officer, left a few weeks ago. And he was ex-Sprint um, all those years ago. Stephen's been around for a while. And that was a shock that he's gone. And uh, there's lots of rumors flying around. But basically, he and Charlie Ergen were butting heads on who are they going to sell to. Because there's been two ideas. One is you go pure wholesale enterprise. Just go sell a billion minutes to, or a billion gigs to Amazon Web Service, to Amazon, right? Or Microsoft, or whatever, Google. And or go retail, um, you know, you and I. And uh, so the fact Stephen left and they're looking for that money, I thought was is, is pretty interesting.